Well, good morning. Welcome. Good morning. Thanks for coming in this chilly morning. Please stand if you are willing and able for our worship this morning. introduce our friends from um, an internship through Regions Beyond. So to my immediate left here is Aaliyah. She's from Missoula. And Chloe is from London on the keyboard. And we're just so excited to have them. They're um, in a 10-month internship. So they're out of Missoula right now. And they're just with us for this week. So thank you for welcoming them. We're excited that you guys are leading worship with us today. Darkness runs but cold 
when you move No one turned away Cause where you are Fear turns into praises Where you are No hearts left unchanged So come, ooh, and justice roll on like a river. Let worship turn into revival. Lord, lead us back to you. When you move, the outcast finds a family. When you move, Lord, here we are. Lord, teach us to love mercy. With humble hearts, we bow down at your throne. So God, move and justice roll on like a river. And worship. Justice roll on like a river. Now watch it turn into revival. Lord, lead us back to you. King of all generation, let every tongue and nation surrender. Justice roll on like a river. Let worship turn into revival. Don't lead us back to you. So come, move, and justice roll on like a river. Worship turn into revival. Don't lead
Good morning, Mount Helena Community Church. In the book of Galatians, it says it is for freedom that you have been set free. Aren't you glad to be free? Free from the chains of sin, free from guilt, free from shame. Uh, You know, the Bible tells a story that uh, when King David was bringing the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem, he danced before the Lord with all of his might, even to the point of embarrassing his wife. Really wouldn't hurt my feelings too much if some of you embarrassed your spouse by dancing in worship. Why? Because God is worthy of such praise and honor, isn't he? He's worthy of it. I did just come back from South Africa where dancing is a way of life. And uh, we could use some more of that around here. I can tell you that. Uh, I am glad to be home, uh, except for this white stuff outside on the ground. It was summertime there, and then I landed here and was frostbitten within about two seconds. So I'm, I am glad to be home. Uh, I'm still, I got here Wednesday night. I still got a little bit of vertigo going on, and my body still thinks it's nine hours ahead of now. Uh, so it takes a little bit of adjustment, but I am glad to be home. I appreciate everybody uh, serving and helping while I was gone. I've heard good things about the messages and the services and what's going on around here while I was gone, so I appreciate that. Uh, if you're a guest with us this morning, my name is J.R. Quigley. I'm the senior leader here at Mount Helena. I want to let you know we do have a welcome packet for you out at the Welcome Center. Hey, how about all those treats out there in the lobby this morning, huh? Christmas time is not the time to start a diet, I can tell you that. Yeah, so I uh, appreciate you joining us, though. Uh, I do have a couple of announcements for you this morning. The first one is that we are having a scavenger hunt December 14th. Do we have a slide for that? We're going to be gathering here uh, at the church at, what is that, 630? Uh, It's a family event. We're going to be running around Helena looking for certain kinds of lights, etc., etc. There'll be prizes and cocoa and, what's the last one? Fun. It's okay to have fun. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, That'll be good. Also, I want to let you know that we do have a few boxes left, or at least we did a few minutes ago. Uh, for our Salvation Army uh, dinner drive. If you want to pick one of those up and fill them up, you sure could do that. Or if you would like to donate, what we do is we get gift cards. You know, you can't buy a turkey or a ham and then throw it in a box for a few weeks. It doesn't work very well. So what we do is we provide a gift card to help the person that receives that box to purchase a turkey or a ham or something like that. So you can just donate uh, finances to that. You could uh, just put it in an envelope or mark on a check that what it's for, and you can leave it at one of our giving stations that is out in the lobby. So we appreciate your participation with that. Those are due next Sunday. They need to be back here. So would appreciate that if you, if you want to continue to participate in that. All right, I also want to let you know that my fellow elder, Mr. Corey Swanson, has returned from the Middle East. Corey was serving uh, in the military there and leading quite a crew of guys, and so I'm looking forward to hearing some of his stories and experiences uh, while he was there, but we're sure glad to have you home, Corey, and appreciate your service. Uh, Yeah. Also, I am really excited to be able to introduce to you my other fellow elder who will be sharing the message with us this morning, Mr. Tyler Redden. Would you please welcome him up this morning? Check, check, there we go. Uh, it has been a minute since I've been up here. Yeah. Um, well, I'm, I'm quite excited for the opportunity. So if you didn't know, um, my wife, Leslie and I, right over here, she, uh, we went on sabbatical. Yeah, you can clap for that. It's okay. I do every day in my head. Uh, we went on sabbatical earlier this year uh, over the summer. And so what I hope to do this morning Everybody, you know, since coming back says, um, how, how did it go? And my first answer is, <sighs> because it's, it's quite a story. So this morning what I want to do is I want to I peel back the experience a little bit. I want to give you the highs and the lows. And I'm just going to ask you this morning permission to speak freely. Because um, this is one that I, I normally... I normally send my message to my wife and just say, hey, you know, sometimes, a lot of times I'm an idiot, so I just don't want to be an idiot on the stage. And this one, I said, this is, this is honest. And she's basically said, yeah, sounds good. So, um, but I, I don't want to just focus on me because um, 
what I hope to do is I, there's a few steps and a few things that we learned over the summer that I really hope is encouraging you. So it's not just a story about Tyler and Leslie. I really hope that this is encouraging you for your journey. So consequently, I've named our message, the message this morning, God Pursues Us. Uh, so Leslie and I, we, we began our sabbatical in July and it went through September, so three months. And a question that we actually got was, um, Why? Because isn't a a sabbatical typically reserved for church staff? And why did we need a sabbatical? I mean, it's a fair question. So, I mean, sabbatical, I I think it actually started in the academic world, and then the the church adopted it. And so we've we've been actually doing, you know, we had JR go on a sabbatical, and so it's it's not just, you know, it's not just an academic thing, and it's actually not just reserved for church staff either. We we really we knew that we were tired. But we didn't know how tired we were until we would find that out later. So what were we tired from? That's, that's a sincere question. Uh, well, to give you a quick summary, we're not going to go into the whole thing, but we've been, Leslie and I have been in some sort of church leadership uh, since we got married in 2002. So over 20 years ago, we've, we've been doing this. So uh, just a real quick 30,000 foot, we, we got married in 2002, we went on, we did an online Bible college, uh, we then started uh, the junior high ministry here. Um, with a horrible graphic and a horrible logo that has since been retired. Uh, 2004, we moved to Michigan to what was supposed to be a six-month internship. That actually ended up being a 12-month internship. And at the end of that internship, the pastor, who we still dearly love, said, would you consider moving here and coming on staff? And so after a lot of prayer, we said, okay, we're going to move. And so we moved all of our stuff. Um, I was ordained there, set in as an associate pastor. We were there for five years. Um, I'm just skipping ahead a lot of this stuff. So then we, we moved back here, uh, 2010. Uh, I was an ordained as an elder. Jar and I, we uh, were ordained the same day. So that's a, that's a great memory of mine. And we've continued in, in various roles here, including an elder, speaker. We've led various things and volunteered in various things. So that's all been great. Okay, that's all been fantastic. Then in 2020, I don't know if you remember this or not, but a little thing called the global pandemic happened. Right? Does anybody else remember that? Okay, just me. Great. Uh, so all of a sudden, in addition to everything else leaders all across the world were doing, um, now leaders had to become experts on social distancing and masks and vaccines. You know, I feel like we heard about this for 24 hours and then we, we had to have an opinion about it and we had to be experts about it. And so um, in addition, like we, we weren't meeting and so here at Mount Helena, we also had this, because we, we still wanted to meet, we still wanted to be in community with one another. We had to figure out how to do virtual online services, and weren't those fun? Uh, because I remember a few of you were, I just loved it because you were in your pajamas, you didn't care, you still had the video on, which was great, and we did a few of those. And so I'm really happy that we don't have to do those and that we can meet in person. If you're ever, like, forget that, just be thankful that we can meet in person. So we, we had all that, and I remember that was... That was some of the time that we first started getting tired. We first started, like Clem puts it this way, like you're running a marathon and now COVID hits and you've been given a 50 pound weight and you still have to run the marathon. And that was just, gosh, that was such a good analogy. Uh, so we, I remember that COVID started, you know, we started to kind of get out of the woods a little bit. COVID started to not be quite as intense and we thought we were out of the woods. And I really considered, I'm like, okay, is this the time that, that Leslie and I can just take a little bit of a rest and I, I honestly, I was trying to remember, I think it was a couple weeks after I had that thought that I was home, I had just gotten off work, turned the news on, which is not typical for me. I don't normally turn the news on when I get home, but I turned the news on that day. And in the news, uh, that's when we heard the first time about a lawsuit that was against the church and some former leaders here. And I knew at that moment, whoom, rest right out the window, because I'm not we're not doing that. Like, I'm not taking a rest while we still have to do this. So that was a, that was a six, eight month, however long it was. And uh, fortunately, we navigated that. Summer started and things began to get back to normal. Um, but there was still a problem. We were still tired. We were still tired. How did I know that I was tired? Um, Leslie obviously had a different experience, but I'll speak for me. There were some red flags in me that I, I could see. Now, normally, I'm always considering what my next message is going to be. Like, it's just 
a part of me. Like I, I usually have a, at least a, a list of two to three topics or two to three verses. I always have, I'm always looking towards what's next. And during that season, the, the list went down to, I'm trying to remember, oh yeah, zero. <laughs> I, I didn't have anything in the tank. But here's the thing. I didn't want to have anything in the tank. I remember that I, I was spent. I was done. And I was fine with that. I didn't have anything in the tank. Here's the other red flag that I saw in me. Um, and just so you know, I wasn't this self-aware when I was writing this message. I was like, oh, dang, okay. Um, the other red flag in me is I stopped reading the Bible. And now this wasn't, it wasn't a deconstruction thing, and it wasn't out of principle. I just stopped doing it. Um, it wasn't even purposeful. I can't even say that it, I purposed to not read it. I just stopped. Um, but I did notice this, that without the impetus to prepare a message every four to six weeks, I... I didn't have to read, right? I didn't have to read the Bible to do a message every four to six weeks, so I just stopped reading. Plus, here's a thought that was actually in my head, and it's not one of my prouder thoughts. This is where I get honest. I actually thought to myself, I've read it before a few times. Um, I'm, I'm okay if I take a minute and not read. So I knew we were tired, and I, need, I knew we needed this outside voice, so we reached out to our friend Mark Spencer, who's been here multiple times, pastor, counselor, and as I was talking to Mark, he encouraged us to really rest, and he, he had this statement that he's become known for, and he said that revelation only comes out of rest. As you look through the Bible, revelation only comes out of rest, and so he encouraged us to really rest, and he asked me this question. He says, how long has it been since you've been able to go to church and not have an opinion about something. And I, I, I mean, I still remember, I said, I, I, don't, I don't know. I said, maybe when we first got married 20 years ago? And his face just went kind of, you know, big eyes. Um, so Mark gave us some good advice. He knew we were going to, part of our summer was we were going to go to these other churches just to see what they were doing, get refreshed. And so he said, you... He knows us well enough to know. He says, you respond with your feelings. He said, so what you're going to do is you're going to go to these churches and you're going to try to steal what you can and bring it back home. He says, don't do that. He says, after every service you go to, take your wife out to breakfast, take your wife out to lunch, and talk about how you feel, how that service made you feel. And I was like, man, that is great advice. So we went to four different services, went to three in Helena, one in Great Falls. And for the most part, you know, we, we went to breakfast, lunch after every one of them. For the most part, after every one of those, we felt refreshed. We felt like, oh, okay. We, we went to one of the services here in town. Worship got done. And I was like, that's it? Like, can, can you do another one? Like, it was just so refreshing. And um, it was just so great. And uh, there was just something about getting out of our, our normal thing that, that really refreshed us. And the travel we did this summer was great. So all that to say, I think this was the first time that we, we took advantage of summer rather than summer just happening. We, we kind of, this is dorky, but we had a spreadsheet to talk about each one of our weekends to make sure that we were doing things we wanted to do. Yeah, I know. It was color-coded as well. Yeah. Yes, we'll, pu- we'll put it on the website if you want to copy the template. So overall, our, our time was good. The, the time really helped me remember this, that, that leadership is a privilege. It really is. Um, Simon Sinek, which is an author, and he's this leadership smart guy, he recently was asked the question, why do you lead? Why do you lead? And his answer, single sentence, struck me, and he said this. He says, if you care to see others succeed, that is why you lead. A local friend of mine recently said, it's both the hardest and the most rewarding thing you'll ever do. At the end of the day, this summer, it, it really helped me remember that it's a privilege and an honor, but... It took a process to get there. It took a process for me to help realize that. And so that's why I've named the message this morning, God Pursues Us, because I want to I share a little bit about the journey and hopefully you see some of your own life in this. So here's, here's the truth that I was reminded of. This is really important. The reason that any of us are here this morning, physically in this room, or if you're listening to the message later through our, our online, our podcast, the reason that any of us are here, I have news for you. It's not because of anything you have done. It's not because of how many prayer services you've went to or how many Bible verses you've memorized or what time you got to church this morning. It's not because of any of that. The, the reason that any of us are here is because God first pursued us. And I want to show you a, a really great thing in the Bible. So if we look at 
Genesis 3.8, the, where it all started, where your story began. Even if you didn't know it, this is where your, your story began. This is Adam and Eve. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said this, where are you? That's how I picture him saying it. Where are you? Big garden. This is the beginning of the story. Adam and Eve had just been created and notice already who was pursuing who. God is looking for man and man is hiding from God. Now here's an interesting little side note about this. God pursues us even when we're hiding. Did you know that? Adam and Eve, they had just eaten the fruit that they weren't supposed to and they were hiding because they were afraid and God still is pursuing them. And I think somehow in our culture today, we forget that. Um, J.R. was actually talking about this in the huddle, and he didn't read my notes before this, but I was like, did you read my notes? Um, There's this belief out there that I think as long as we do the right things, if we attend church every week, if we go to the prayer meetings, if we tithe when we're supposed to, if we do the small group, that, I mean, all those things are good, okay? Don't get me wrong. All those things are good, but they don't represent the totality of our relationship with God. Our relationship with God is not dependent upon those things. Those things are good, But Adam and Eve weren't doing those things. They were hiding in the garden and God still pursued them. Even when we're not doing those things, God is pursuing us. And I want to give you an example from the summer. So as I said, we we started in July and we were tired and I know I wasn't reading like I should and and I was actually okay with that, taking a break, but I still had this like, um, like this pull, honestly, to do those things because, I mean, I was still tired, but I still had this pull. And I I think if I'm really honest, this is what I actually didn't realize until I was writing this message. Um, So much of my spirituality has been tied to my role in the church. Uh, I became a Christian in 1999, and I mean, a couple months after that, I started leading worship, and then we led a youth ministry. And so my spirituality has always been tied to my role in the church. So in my head, subconsciously, I thought, okay, if I start reading again, I'm going back to work. And I didn't want to go back to work. Just flat out honest. I just wasn't ready. But God was pursuing me. And I want to tell you how he did it. I had a dream one night. Um, like, literal dream. It's not like Martin Luther King. I actually had a dream. <laughs> and I heard a voice in this dream. And the, and the voice said, read Psalm 5.3. And I remember this because this is, this is me. I was arguing with the dream, this voice. And I was like, mm, I think what you mean is read Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all your understanding, blah, 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 blah. It's okay. And this voice said, that's not what I said. <laughs> I said, read Psalm 5, 3. So I did what most people do. I forgot about it. And then when I pulled into work, the parking lot, I remembered everything. So I went into my office, pulled up my phone, and I read what Psalm 5, 3 says. It says this, in the morning, Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I lay my requests before you and I wait expectantly. And man, I knew what it meant. I knew God was saying, all right, son, it's time to get back to it. It's time to read, pray, use your voice. And I believe in that dream, God was saying, where are you? Not because he didn't know where I was, obviously he did, but I believe that sometimes we don't know where we are. I didn't know how tired I was until I stopped doing what I was doing. Where are you? In the morning, Lord, you hear my voice. But see, this is this is where it gets funny. I still didn't do it. I still didn't read. I still didn't want to do it. I wasn't ready to go back to work. But still, there was this pull because it's so much a part of who I am. So usually in my day, I I take a couple walks and I usually try to listen to a podcast or music and I just need margin in my day. I think it's really helpful for all of us. So I I wanted to refresh my podcasts a bit. So I found a couple great podcasts to listen to. Um, And I think we have a couple pictures of those. First one I found was it's called The Bible in a Year with Father Mike Schmitz. Now this is interesting because the only reason I found this one is because it's the top podcast in the United States under religion and, and spirituality. And so what Father Mike does is He reads a portion of the Bible, and then he comments on it. So this one does have a Catholic bend to it, but I found it interesting. And then the other one, I've I've listened to this one for years. It's called the Bible Recap. This one's phenomenal. It's non-denominational. She doesn't read the Bible. You're on your own for that, but then she comments on it. It's fantastic teaching. 
So here's what's interesting. I, I wasn't reading. I, I still felt like I wasn't doing the thing, but I was engaging with scripture again. Maybe for the first time in a long time, I wasn't doing it for a message. I was doing it for me. I was doing it just because I wanted to do it. Um, and that was, that was great. In Adam's story, God says, where are you? And Adam was hiding. He wasn't saying anything, but then Adam speaks up and he says, I was, I was afraid. That's why I was hiding. And then God basically says, paraphrase, God says, well, tell me about it. Tell me about why you're afraid. Tell me about that. And did you, did you catch that from one question? He says, where are you? And God pursues man and man, honestly, he says, I was afraid. He starts to engage God again. He didn't know that, but he was engaging God. I love how God says, well, well just, just tell me about it. See, God, God knows how to pursue his creation, doesn't he? He doesn't do it all the same way all the time, but he knows how to pursue you. He knows how to get our attention, even when we're tired or not doing this, the same things we were doing. You guys, I know that in our world today, there is so much going on. I mean, we have information coming at us all the time. We have cameras everywhere. We have microphones everywhere. And sometimes the first thing we do when we wake up is we start scrolling. We start scrolling this stuff. And then you combine that with your real life responsibilities and the crazy schedules and family stuff you have. And sometimes this results in the best part of your day being when you hit the pillow at night. And I, I actually don't have an easy fix for you this morning. I don't have three points for you this morning to say if you do one, two, three, it's going to be fixed because I don't. But I do want to say to you this, that in the midst of that, God is pursuing you. In the midst of all that craziness, God is pursuing you. Maybe even in this moment, God is pursuing you in this moment. You say, you know what? Well, um, a friend invited me this morning, so nah, God's pursuing you. You're here because God is pursuing you. And you say, well, I, you know what, actually, I just found this website online. I just found this podcast. God is pursuing you. If you are listening to this whenever you are, know that God is pursuing you. And maybe you're saying, you know what? I don't even really want to be here this morning for whatever reason. And I say, God is pursuing you. In this moment, God is pursuing you. He has, our Bible tells us that he has a plan for you that includes a future and a hope. The interesting about that verse He told that to the person when that person was in captivity. The person was in captivity and things were not going well. And God said, I have a plan for you. It gets printed out on all of our houses and quilts. And that's actually a pretty revelatory verse. He's saying, you know what? I have a plan for you. Plans for future and a hope. In the New Testament, he says, I want you to live life to the full, it says in John. God is pursuing you because that's what he does. So I was engaging with God again. It was going well. I was listening to this verse. But I was still thinking about the stuff. All the stuff that Leslie and I were doing. And, and again, I mean, it's all good, but what do, I, what do I pick up? What do I do? And honestly, I got a, I got a little nervous about it because I just didn't know what we were supposed to do. And God is pursuing us again. You remember the Great Commission? When, when Jesus, right before he was leaving the earth, he gave the disciples these marching orders. And he says this, he says, Matthew 28, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Something I recently noticed. Some translations replace the words, and surely, with, and lo, I am with you always. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Why does that matter? Because sometimes you're not feeling the go, right? Sometimes you ain't feeling the go. And you look at all the stuff you have to do and all the stuff that God is calling you to and you're like, oh, I don't know if I have it in me. And I started to say it like this, that when you're not feeling the go, pay attention to the low. Because God said, surely and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Some of you guys this morning, that's all you need to hear. Some of you guys, you're going to check out at this point, and that's okay. Because what you've heard is maybe you need to pause on some of your go and pay attention to the low. Maybe you're just so busy doing the stuff that you've forgotten that God's saying, I'm with you always. And what does that mean to you? What does it look like if we believe that this morning, that God is with you always? So I was feeling that way. I didn't know what to pick up, but God is pursuing me. Because I went out on a walk, and I, I was listening to the scripture, and I heard this verse that I know, I've, I've read it, but I've never noticed it. 
and it, be, it would become a daily prayer of mine through summer. It was Psalm verse 90, verse 17, and it says, Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands. Yes, establish the work of our hands. It's always, here's Bible reading 101. Whenever it's repeated, actually, this is like life 101, especially married life 101. Whenever it's repeated, pay attention. And God is repeating something. Establish the work of our hands. Yes, establish the work of our hands. That became a daily prayer. I started praying, okay, God, not continue, not what do you want me to do? Establish, it's new. Establish the work of our hands. So wouldn't you know it, a couple weeks later, on the same path, on the same walk, I hear another verse. This time in Nehemiah, chapter 6, verse, now, verse 9. But now, O oh God, strengthen my hands. Go and make disciples. And lo, just in case you forget, I am with you always. Establish the work of my hand. And now strengthen the work of my hands. Through my walks and during the day, and just t- taking time to slow down, God was taking me on this process because that is what he does since the beginning. I want to ask you this morning, how is God pursuing you in this season? And don't tell me he's not. Four months ago, I might have agreed with you, honestly. But today I won't. Because I know that God is pursuing you. If he cares enough about me, he cares enough about you. God is pursuing you in this season. You might say, it doesn't feel like an... Uh, Amen. I get it. Doesn't mean he's not. Doesn't mean he's not. Sometimes we just have to get out of our way to see that. We are here because he's first pursued us and he continues to pursue us. And I, you even might be here and you might say, yeah, Tyler, but if you knew my story, this sounds good for the church folks, but if you knew my story, you wouldn't say that to me. That doesn't apply to me. If that is you this morning, I have really, really good news for you this morning. God knows your story. He knows your history. He knows your past and he knows your future. And he is pursuing you all the same. Like I said, you're here, aren't you? You're listening to this message, aren't you? There's a great story that Jesus tells. He's got some friends and he's telling the story to illustrate this point. And it's about a shepherd in Matthew 18. He tells a story. He says, what do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly, I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the 99 that never went astray. Do you know why the the shepherd left the 99? I mean, it it doesn't make any sense, does it? Like, wouldn't the 99 be thinking, aren't we more valuable than this one? I mean, aren't we the majority? Like, aren't aren't we what's, what's really the important thing? And I heard it said recently that maybe the shepherd, we always focus on the one, but maybe the shepherd had to leave the 99 for the 99, because he wanted the 99 to know how important just one was. The 99 were fine, but I think he wanted to teach the 99 a lesson. So if this is the first time you've heard this in your life, let alone in a church, I want to tell you this, you are valuable. You are absolutely valuable, and your story, whatever is in the past, got you here. And you are worth pursuing, and God has a plan for your life. I am convinced of it. Another story that Jesus told around the same lines, he was talking about a father that had two sons, and one of them went away and said, you know, I'm done with you. One of them stayed there. So when one of the sons that went away, he says, you know what, I'm I'm sleeping with the pigs, and I'm going to go back to my father. In Luke 15, 20, this is one of my favorite verses in the entire Bible, Luke 15, 20, but while he, the son, was still a long way off, His father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. You remember, this is going to age me a little bit, but you remember, anybody know who Tom Bodette is? What what business did Tom Bodette have? Hotel, that's right. What was Tom's promise to us? He's going to leave the light on for us. Tom got that from this story. He just ripped off Luke. Because the father left the light on for the son. This son was horrible to his dad. He said, you know what? I want my inheritance now. I'm done with you. That usually happened when the father died. So the son's saying, you're dead to me. Give me my stuff. That's horrible. And the father said, I'm leaving the light on for you. I am never going to stop looking for you. You guys, 
Here's, here's, a story, here's a, the, the truth about this story. That's a picture of the gospel. You want to know what the gospel is? You want to know what the good news of the New Testament is? It's that right there. The father in this story is God. The son is you. The son is me. When you're out doing your own thing, and that moment you realize, I got to come home. And you come home to God and you, and you smell like pain and loss and brokenness and sin. What does God do? What's the father do in Luke 15, 22? But the father said to his servants, he sees his son a long way off. He sees his son. He says, bring quickly the best robe. Have you ever thought about this? Who had the best robe in this story? Who would have had the best robe? The father. He's saying, bring my robe and put it on my son. He said, put it on him, put a ring on his hand, identification, and shoes on his feet, and bring the fattened calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead. He's alive again. He was lost. He's found. This is true with all of us, you guys. The father says, you've been out doing your own thing. It's time to come home. I see you. I'm going to put my robe on you, which is Jesus. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Come home. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Through Jesus, you are completely accepted. You don't have to run anymore. You are completely righteous. You are completely forgiven. And most of all, you are completely loved. You have a rightful seat at this table. And let me tell you this, you have a seat here. You absolutely have a seat here. You guys, if... If this rest has taught me anything that I want to impart to you, it's that God pursues us. Always. I don't care if you've been doing this for 10 minutes or 100 years. God is still pursuing you. He is still in the business of you. Not just when we're doing the right things, but always. There's a French writer, and aviator that I read this summer, and he, he said this. He says, if you want to build a ship, don't drum up people together to collect wood and don't assign them tasks and work but rather teach them to long for the endless immensity of the sea. There's no doubt that with this larger group of people represented, everybody listening online, you guys, I know you all have ships to build. You all have stuff to do. I get it. But maybe, do we get so caught up with building the ship and everything that goes along with that, collecting wood and the tasks, that we forgot about the endless immensity of the sea? If that's you this morning... I want to I ask you, what do you need to do? What do you need to do to put yourself in the position in which you long, not for the endless immensity of the sea, but in which you long for the things of God again? What do you need to do? Like I say, I don't have three points for you. I can't answer that question for you because it's you. It's God pursuing you this morning. But I do want to ask, what do you need to do so that you get yourself in a position where you say, oh, this is what I do. This is why I do it. Is it a rest? Is it, is it, a, is it a change of place and perspective? Is it, is it a conversation with a good friend? Maybe it is a good book or podcast. I mean, a few of the resources that, um, I'll just put them up on the screen. A few of those resources that really helped me over the summer was a few books and a few podcasts that we'll put up on the screen. Those, those might help. And as well as those things are, they're just tools, you guys. They're just methods God uses to pursue you. So we're going to end this morning the way we started. Where are you? Where are you? And for some people in this room, God's saying, where are you? What's the next step in your faith journey? Well, Tyler, I don't have, an, I don't have a faith journey. It just started. Is it to pause? Is it to pause your go and you focus on the low? Is that your next step? Or maybe your next step is to ask God, establish the work of my hands. Or maybe it's, you know what? Strengthen. I got this thing coming up. I got this, this movement coming up. I got this, this thing. Strengthen the work of my hands. Maybe that's what it is. Or maybe you're in the position where it's time to come home. Maybe you've been out doing your own thing and you've been out running and even as I say this, your heart is beating quicker because you know what I'm talking about. I've I've literally been in that seat and you know it's time to come home. 
If that is you this morning, I'm not pressuring you into a, buying a condo or anything like that, but I am offering. If that is you this morning, we're going to have a, a prayer team up here that would love to talk to you. Uh, any of us would love to chat with you. If you're listening to this online, send us a message through the socials or through email or through Pigeon, however you want to do it. But the important thing is we want to help you. We want to help you take that next step. If you say, Tyler, yes, it's time for me to come home, do it. But here's my, here's my question to all of us. Whatever the case may be this morning, know that God is pursuing you. The question that I have for you is what's your response going to be? You're going to have a response. The question is, what's it going to be? Let me pray for you as we close. Lord, thanks for never stopping to pursue us, God. Thanks for never stopping to say, where are you? And never stopping to remind us of our, of our plans, God, and how you just say, you know what? My ways are higher than your ways. Thank you that you're a good God. And Father, I just pray for courage for this group of people, Lord, that as they slow down and as they just even ask you, God, what the next step is. I pray for courage for them to take those next steps. And, and if this is you and you say, you know what, I've never taken that step, I pray for courage for you this morning to stand up and come on up and, and talk with us because we would love to talk, talk with you this morning. Just pray a blessing on our day, Lord, that we would just glorify you with our life. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Tyler. Would you give Tyler a hand? I just want to reiterate if the Holy Spirit's tugging on your heart, hey, you've got to respond somehow. No matter where you're at in your journey, respond in prayer. Our prayer team would love to pray with you and encourage you or any one of us, elders or staff, would love to do that. That is the conclusion of our service this morning. I'd like to thank you for joining us. Uh, I hope you have a great rest of your week, and we will see you back here next week. Have a great day.